Okay, good. People are joining. We have over 75 participants right away. Welcome, everybody. Today's event is Empire of Resentment, Populism's Toxic Embrace of Nationalism, something we're all uh, familiar with unpleasantly right now. I'm Stephen Small, Interim Director of the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues. The Institute is the institutional home of the Berkeley Center for Right-Wing Studies, which is the sponsor of today's event. The format of the event is that each of our three speakers, Larry Rosenthal, Cynthia Miller Idris, and Corey Fields, will share brief prepared remarks. We had a fourth speaker. Unfortunately, that speaker, Vibhika Shao Jalave, is unable to join us today. Okay. What will happen next is I'll introduce each person just before they speak. Then we'll have a Q&A. If amongst the participants or those in attendance you have a question, please use the Q&A feature. You can post your question and then we'll address those questions. I'll ask those questions on your behalf. Okay, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Larry Rosenthal, my friend and colleague who is chair of the Center for Right-Wing Studies. His most recent book, Empire of Resentment, Populism's Toxic Embrace of Nationalism is the focus and fulcrum of today's event. Welcome, Dr. Larry L Rosenthal. Please go ahead. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and thank, thanks to um, Cynthia and Corey and to, and to the people tuning in. Um, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about um, uh, to, the, the, in the book, in the book, uh, mostly what I deal with is the development of right-wing populism and its and its connection to international illiberalism, beginning with the Tea Party years and into the Trump years. <clears throat> and I argue in the book, insofar as I address 2020, uh, I argue in the book that 2016 and 2018 were negative partisanship elections. Elections which were <clears throat> determined above all by people voting against the opposition. So in 2016, the right despised Hillary Clinton and came out in droves for her uh, to vote against her. Two years later, uh, Blue America had experienced two years of Trump in office and they came out in wave numbers in 2018. Both were negative partisanship elections. And I, I thought that negative partisanship was going to explain 2020 as, as well. And that it would be um, in a way uh, 2018 on steroids, um, voting, voting against heavily against Donald Trump Two, two, two further years into his presidency. But it didn't appear that way. Um, two more years on, and it appears that Red America, in my view, was voting less against Biden and less against, um, in, in, in terms of negative partisanship, than for a leader, Trump, they had fallen in love with. The sure, resentment of the liberal world, the, which is the dominant motivator of right-wing populism was still intact, but it was as though there had been a cathexis to Trumpism and Trump's increasing numbers showed us that that constituency has grown. So there's a new reality I think we have to deal with. To put that in context, let's go back to 2009. In 2009, Republican thinking was dominated by the idea that they were living under a demographic sort of Damocles. This is um, uh, Mitch McConnell in 2009. We're all concerned around the about the fact that the very wealthy and the very poor the most and least educated and a majority of minority voters seem to have more or less stopped paying attention to us. And we should be concerned that as a result of all this, the Republican party seems to be slipping into a position of being more of a regional party 
than a national one. That's 2009. In, 2000, in the run-up to 2016, Lindsey Graham said the following, if we don't pass immigration reform, if we don't get it off the table and in a reasonable, practical way, it doesn't matter who you run in 2016. We're in, and this is his phrase, a demograph demographic death spiral as a party. And the only way we can get back in good graces with the Hispanic community, in my view, is to pass comprehensive immigration reform. If you don't do that, it really doesn't matter who we run. It is fair to say that in 2016, Donald Trump disproved all that. Um, he did the exact opposite of what was the prescription, the implied prescription in, in, in this uh, conviction about the, uh, the fate of the Republican party. And, and there were 16 opponents in the, in the um, in the Republican primaries, all of whom were in some sense in favor of, as they called it, comprehensive immigration reform. He not only did the opposite, he did it in an extreme manner. He was gonna build a wall um, and he won. And if you think back on his campaign, both in the primaries and in the general election, he ran on demonizing the immigrants. His essential narrative was about crime, that the immigrants were bringing crime. There was rape, there were drugs, there was murder. And this went on into the, into the presidency. He would put people in the gallery at the State of the Union, have them, have them stand up, and they were the victims of crime on, uh, on the part of, of immigrants. Um, so that was Trump's brand. Now, if you cut to 2020, one of the extraordinary things about the 2020 campaign is uh, the Trump campaign hardly mentioned immigrants. Instead, it was a campaign which was conditioned by, it seems to me, two huge developments of 2020 that uh, manifested themselves in, in uh, street protests uh, uh, at, at um, uh, it, it, in through it, across the country, um, those those were the anti-lockdown demonstrations and the post-George Floyd Black Lives Matter demonstrations. Um, let me take an, a, a moment to do an aside, which I talk about in the book, and that there's a continuity between right-wing populism and let's call it um, kind of uh, uh, ordinary right-wing populism and the mil militia-like extremes. Uh, there's a continuity between them. So to take um, one of the extremes, white nationalism, the, these are people who will talk about replacement theory, being replaced, will we'll take it to an extreme like white genocide um, but there's a continuity into populist America with their sense of dispossession and their sense of identity, which is based on the othering of people who um, they, believe, they believe are dispossessing them. I, I go into this a great deal in the book. Similarly, anti-government is the other uh, most important, let's call it, uh, um, right-wing militia-like formation. Um, and there's a continuity back into, um, for example, the Tea Party used to talk in terms of what was called at the time populist constitutionalism. In, in, uh, in that view, Obama was a tyrant. Um, and that's, as I say, in continuity with uh, the extremes, which in 2020 uh, became known for accelerationism or the idea that we are on the, the cusp of a civil war, uh, 
and the Proud Boys and, and similar uh, movements became extremely well known. So these two uh, developments, the anti-lockdown demonstrations and the uh, um, George Floyd demonstrations uh, were almost precisely aimed at stirring up white nationalism on the one hand and uh, anti-government grievances on the other. And so what became the narrative of Trump's 2020 campaign? Remember, the narrative of the 2016 campaign was uh, uh, immigrants are, are storming America and bringing crime. The narrative of the 2020 campaign was that Antifa, Black Lives Matter, et cetera, et cetera, are running wild on the streets and they're gonna get rid of police protection and that the Democrats are in thrall to their left wing, um, which is going to bring all these things and Biden himself is merely a cipher for all this. In other words, the demonized other of 2020 was no longer the immigrants. It was in effect the entirety of blue America. And again, there was continuity with an extreme. In this case, the extreme is QAnon. Um, QAnon, how do you, you say? You might say QAnon puts the demon back in demonizing. That is to say, they believe that blue America, especially its leadership, um, are Satanists and that they are doing the worst things imaginable. They're pedophiles. They are engaging in satanic rituals. Um, they're drinking the blood of children, resurrecting kind of, of almost an underground or archetype of the most awful things that are attributed to uh, a, a despised other. These are thought you know, familiar from things like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Um, and Trump himself, who would never um, disown the anti-government extremists like the Proud Boys, who he called out to in his debate, or the white nationalists who were uh, good people on other so either side, he also would not um, disown QAnon. What 2020 finally, in, in, in my view, came to represent was a further kind of sense of dispossession uh, on the part of right America, right wing populists and so forth. And this was now the idea, if, if remember, dispossession is about something being taken away that you feel is yours. And now the thing being taken away was the presidency. And this elicited uh, this extra extraordinary response and the identity that had, that had developed um, over the course of the Tea Party era and then the early Trump era um, now became directly connected to Trump in a way that previously things like negative partisanship had, it, it had not been at that level. So if my book, Empire of Resentment is about the arc of American right-wing populism from the Tea Party into the Trump years, I think it now needs to be understood as the, um, uh, the basis upon which this has now moved into a kind of Trump as uh, a charismatic um, uh, strongman leader in the classic sense, uh, uh, 
along the sense of the leadership principle of Führer Prinzip um, of the of the night of the twentieth century, and I would think that the conviction of a stolen election, the thing that we had that got taken away, may well be the defining characteristic of right wing populism going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Larry. Uh, if I may summarize, you've given us a very stimulating set of, oh, let me open this. There I am, thank you very much, Larry. Uh, you've given us a very stimulating set of thoughts around context, continuum, continuities, and the conflict it all implies. Thank you, we'll come back to you later. I'd now like to welcome Professor Cynthia Miller Idris, who is Professor of Education and Sociology and runs the Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab, whose acronym is PERIL. She runs that lab at the American University in Washington, DC. Her most recent book is Hate in the Homeland, the New Global Far Right, which was just published by Princeton University Press this year. Welcome, Professor Cynthia Miller Idris. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And Larry, many, many congratulations on the publication of the book, which I read um, earlier this fall and uh, have found already so useful in my thinking. Um, I am going to just pull up my remarks here. Uh, so I'm not going to use any slides and, uh, and I'll try to keep my remarks brief so we have plenty of time for, for Q&A here. Um, most people who know my work will probably expect that I'll want to focus on the chapter about the alt-right, so I'm not going to do that, but I'm happy to turn to that in Q&A. Uh, what I'd like to do actually is, is focus on um, what I think is, is an equally important or more important part of Larry's work and his book, which is connecting the rise of the Tea Party to the emergence of Trumpism and ultimately to the victory of populist nationalism and the emergence then of the so-called alt-right. So instead of starting with Charlottesville, as many contemporary scholars of the US far right do, Rosenthal connects the thread from the Tea Party the contemporary, you know, all the way up to the contemporary moment. Um, and as uh, Professor Rosenthal rightly argues, um, the Tea Party didn't get Trump elected. You know, Trumpism replaced Tea Party mobilization, as he suggests, as the dominant force that led to Republican electoral success in 2016. But as this book shows, the Tea Party is an important factor in understanding conservatives' mobilization in the years leading up to the Trump administration. And in particular, I think chapter two does a really nice job of tracing parallels in Trump's candidacy with the emergence of the Tea Party. So just as a reminder for those of you listening who haven't read the book yet and may not be familiar, um, the Tea Party emerged on the US political scene in 2009 out of conservative Tea Party protests against Obama administration tax and homeowner relief policies, drawing on the metaphorical power of the American colonist Boston Tea Party protests against the British colonial tax on tea, which is a historical event that, especially for those of you overseas, maybe or may not remember, but it's long lived on in American school textbooks and popular myth and memory as the event that sparked the American Revolution, becoming a symbol of resistance to government tyranny through civil disobedience. We still see that today in in revolutionary garb and hats and militia members in the references to a certain percentage, three or seven of American revolutionists needed to, to um, overthrow the revolution. We'll see that in the militia and the far right anti-government extremist movement, as well as other parts of, of populist and nationalist history. The Tea Party itself strategically used costumes and symbols and Boston Tea Party reenactments to receive outsized media attention and significant financial and strategic support from conservative organizations as Rosenthal has traced in previous work with Christine Trost. Um, and within short order, they grew into a national network of organizations, eventually spanning about a thousand local Tea Party groups across the country. So it was this combination of local bottom-up mobilization and top-down organizational support um, or grassroots and astroturf kinds of organi organizing that created a new form of conservative branding and marketing. Um, so in that way, it was highly significant in American political history, even though only really for a brief period of time. Um, in 2019, CNN's Chris Salisa described it as the dominant movement in American politics at the start of the decade, 
and as a movement that had seized control of the Republican Party. Although by 2019, they had essentially lost their influence and, and had even largely faded from the public's memory. I mean, it came on strong and kind of disappeared, um, particularly in the face of Trump and Trumpism um, and the media attention applied to that. But as Rosenthal helped show, the Tea Party had an impact on conservative political organizing and the populist uh, rhetorical framing of ordinary people against the elites, along with the creation of a new divide, which he argues push, positioned both Democrats and Republicans as the establishment against what Rosenthal calls, quote, the new nationalist alternative. I think that's really important, and it's rarely done in, in work looking at the contemporary movement and linking that to the emergence of of, of far-right movements, um, popular uh, uh, Trumpism, but also the alt-right is unusual and rare, and I think a huge contribution. So if there's one area that I wish Larry had delved into more, uh, and I'll just take the liberty of introducing it here, and maybe we can talk about it in Q&A, it's the gendered aspects of Tea Party mobilization and how that affected conservative women's political engagement and ultimate support for Trump. As we now know, a majority of white women voted for Trump both in 2016 and then even more of them in 2020, according to exit polls. The Tea Party's grassroots organizational structure enabled new modes of participation from women by relocating political activism from the national level to local communities and mobilizing conservative women who had built their lives around more traditional homemaking roles. The Tea Party actively worked to redefine women's issues in new ways that drew women in with a trio of core thematic frames that presented conservative politics in gendered ways, linking motherhood and family protectionism, women's autonomy from government dependence, and reclaiming and defining of feminism or redefining of feminism as based on autonomy rather than choice. So this linked very much up with overall Tea Party frames similar government being better, but linking it to being better for American families and their children's future, the idea that government regulation was patronizing to women, and that the federal government was aiming to restrict women's liberties and their ability to defend themselves against government tyranny. These arguments proved to be especially seductive to conservative women in ways that arguably had an enduring impact on women's and white women's support for Trump in 2016 and 2020. Former Alaska governor and one-time vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin can be credited with much of this reframing, including a direct appeal to what she called mama grizzlies, moms who are rising up and banding together and saying no to big government policies that would, quote, attack their cubs or that weren't right for our kids and our grandkids. Um, Tea Party women ultimately managed to situate good motherhood as a political act that involved fighting back against the fiscal threat posed to their families by big government which would supposedly imperil their children's future economic opportunities. And so in this way, fighting good government, big government um, framed um, conservative activism as moral engagement on the part of good mothers, a reflection of their care for their families and their children's way being, re-intertwining kind of the personal and the political in ways that we had seen earlier in conservative women's mobilization, connecting their roles as mothers to public policies and to laws whose revision might be deemed a threat to their families or their ability to protect them. We saw similar kind of mobilization within the Tea Party around reframing and reclaiming the mantle of feminism itself um, by arguing that the women's movement push for equality had been replaced by an emphasis on choice that moved beyond the movement's ideals um, and arguing that modern feminism is patronizing, fostering dependence on the government, et cetera. And so again, this reframing and very Tea Party kind of language, the kind of language that Larry traces so nicely in this chapter, but here uh, a lot of what the Tea Party did was give it this lens that was reclaiming the true mantle of the women's movement by promoting autonomy from government dependence, self-reliance and personal responsibility. And in so doing, they attracted legions of conservative women who had previously taken a back seat in political movements and activism. And I think some of that uh, mobilization of white women and their support for Trump has to be considered in light of some of those earlier factors in the Tea Party, just as the, the regular roots of populist mobilization have done so uh, in this book so clearly. Um, so there's much to appreciate about Larry Rosenthal's new book. I urge everyone to buy it. There's a lot more I could say about how he connects these threads of populist nationalist mobilization from the Tea Party through Trumpism, the eventual emergence of the alt-right, the so-called alt-right, um, he leaves us quite compellingly with a concluding chapter that raises questions about what all of these developments mean for liberal democracy more broadly.
how deeply has democracy been undermined in the United States? Or can you, as I've often been saying, put the genie back in the bottle? What will the growing phenomenon of fake news or post-truth social media and political culture mean for future elections or political administrations? These are questions that Larry presents um, and doesn't offer any easy answers, but I think it's a very prescient analysis that should make all of us pay more attention in the years to come. Um, so in some, I would say, uh, and I have said in my review of it earlier, that this is you know, an extraordinary account of one of the most consequential developments in US politics by connecting the threads of populist anti-elitism with the nationalist resurgence, um, racist and incendiary anti-immigrant rhetoric and the eventual emergence of the so-called alt-right. And so I would highly recommend it as required reading for anyone trying to make sense of where we are, how we got here and what the future holds for liberal democracy. And I will stop there and um, make sure there's plenty of time for Corey and then we can come back to Q&A. Thank you very much, Professor Cynthia Miller. Address you, given us more than enough time, more than enough things to think about. Thanks for sharing some key insights into Larry's book for people uh, in the audience who have not yet read it and for encouraging them to read it, given its significance and importance. Thanks also for bringing our attention to gender and key gender implications. And also it made me think about some of the books that have been written about white women in the white supremacy movement as part of the continuum. And also about some of the ways in which white supremacists articulate and disarticulate their images around black women and black women's positionality or implied imputed positionality. Okay, thank you. We now turn to our third speaker, Professor Corey Fields. Professor Corey Fields is an associate professor and the Edol or Idol family chair, not sure how to pronounce that, in the sociology department at Georgetown University. Dr. Fields is the author of Black Elephants in the Room, The Unexpected Politics of African-American Republicans. So welcome, Professor Corey Fields. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, and I also would like to congratulate Larry on the publication of an amazing book. Um, we first met when I was a part of a writing group over at the Center for Right Wing Studies when I was um, working on turning um, a wayward dissertation into a book about Black Republicans and Larry and the gang were super helpful in the development of that project. So I'm happy to be uh, back in action with the old team. Um, so uh, in Empire of Resentment, uh, I think it's First off, I want to say that Larry has crafted a powerful story about the migration of Tea Party populists to Donald Trump, right? The book finds parallels between Italian fascism, nationalist movements of the early 1900s, and current illiberal governments in Eastern Europe. Uh, but even though the book does an excellent job of placing the Trump presidency within a broader history of populist uprisings, um, it doesn't lose sight of the uniqueness of our sort of Trumpist moment. Um, and it definitely underscores how the structure of US society and US political institutions specifically facilitated the current political moment, right? So the story is connected to a broader um, sort of historical tradition of populism but Larry makes sure uh, that we're attuned to very much how this is a U.S. story facilitated by U.S. institutions like the media. Um, and so Larry convincingly argues that Trump won in 2016 by getting right-wing populists to migrate from support of free market fundamentalism to an anti-immigrant nationalism. And Larry also shows how Trump managed to get the Christian right to not just come along for the ride, right, but to take pride of place in front of the parade. Um, and the book definitely definitely argues that Trump openly welcomed misogynists and white nationalists into the Republican coalition by providing a very public um, platform for their beliefs and sort of a, an enthusiastic endorsement, if not a direct endorsement. And now, throughout the book, Larry lays out how Trump, you know, united a broad coalition of, I mean, I was going to say seemingly disparate forces, some might call them unseemly disparate forces, but Trump brought them together. 
But today I want to say, talk about what I think is sort of a deeper story to empire of resentment. Um, I think that deeper story speaks to how populism operates as a social form, a form that can take on a wide range of content, right? And Larry also presents a story about the increasing force of partisanship as a form of social identity that motivates behavior, even when that behavior runs counter to other social and political ideals an actor might hold. In the book, in some ways, maybe less intentionally, but I think it's there, um, also illuminates a deeper story about how many of our political fights are about how white the US can be both in terms of its demographics, but also in terms of its understanding of itself, right? Sort of fights about how white the US is. Now, I'll stop back and say that I was particularly struck by Larry's thinking on populism as a concept. And by coincidence, I was teaching classical social theory when I agreed to be on today's panel. And the timing really couldn't have been more fortuitous. Uh, so when I was reading the book, I was fretting over how to get a group of about 40 19 to 20 year olds in a required class to make sense of early 20th century social theories. Um, this was a hard enough task when I have to do it in front of a in a classroom standing in front of them and I can leverage all my interpersonal charm. Uh, but this semester, I was trying to figure out how to do this all online, right? Um, and, you know, in some ways, by sure shit luck, as I was preparing to teach George Zemmel, I was also reading Larry's book. And for those of you who might not know, one of the starting points of Zimmel's thinking is this distinction between form and content, right? And for Zimmel, any social phenomena is composed of these two elements, right? With forms are sort of the mode of interaction among ind individuals, the sort of the shape of which these interactions allow specific content to achieve social reality. So examples of social form, according to Zimmel, would be things like exchange or conflict or domination, right? Or sociability, also, which is, I also taught that essay. But content we can think of as the sort of interest, purpose, or the motive of a phenomena or interaction. Essentially, the content is what it's about, right? And form content analysis rests on two principles that I think, you know, are sort of reinforced by Larry's book. The first being that the same form of social interaction can be observed in dissimilar contexts and in relation to differing purposes. The second point is that any content can be expressed through a variety of different social forms as its medium. Now, with Empire of Resentment, Larry gifted me with an excellent illustration of this dynamic. Um, he carefully lays out the characteristics of populism as a social form, right? And we see that populism has its, a structure and a set of relations, right? And Larry notes how the, use, the idea of an other who generates deep resentment is central to the development of populism as a form. In the case of recent US populist movements, Larry has shown that for the Tea Party activists, financial elites pushing for state intervention and market regulation were positioned as the other, right? Um, and what was so striking about the rise of Trump is that he was able to fill the populism of the US political right with different content. Mm -hmm. In Empire of Resentment, we see how Trump abandoned the populist rights policies of free trade and um, and replace them with new content of anti-immigrant rhetoric, rhetoric and America first nationalism. And while everyone who identifies as a Republican did not endorse this new content, Trump benefited, Trump also benefited from an increase in partisan identity. So by capturing the Republican Party, Trump was able to capture voters who understood themselves to be Republican. In that sense, if Republican is the social form you committed to, you'll also support it no matter what the content is. And so Larry's analysis shows how Trump was able to treat both populism and republicanism as social forms that he could fill with nationalist content. And now the idea that populism is a social form that could be filled with a range of different content 
it went over like gangbusters with my theory students, actually. Uh, it sort of brought the concept to life and you bail, you did me a solid and bailed me out of what was sort of um, at the cusp of being a very awkward Zoom interaction. So thanks for that, Larry. Um, but I think it's Zimmel's second proposition, the idea that the same content can take different forms that might be most telling about Trump's rise. Larry certainly shows how Trump was able to leverage and deploy white grievance in his political ascendancy. And the book frames the white nationalist themes of Trumpism as existing in a thriving sub-community of the internet, right, that Trump was able to leverage. And Larry painstakingly lays out the contours of that universe. And as someone who sort of studied the right and spent a lot of time on right-wing websites, I can sort of empathize with the challenges of having to sort of immerse yourself in that world. However, I would argue that this sort of anti-minority white grievance sentiment that Trump drew on wasn't limited to the dark corners of the internet. In fact, its presence in US politics illustrates how the same content here, white grievance and racism can take many different social forms. Indeed, in my own research, I found that it was present among Republican political elites long before Donald Trump. In fact, the defining experience of Black Republicans is the need to manage the racial concerns of their white counterparts, right? So Black Republicans sort of have to talk about race in a way that sits comfortably with what white gatekeepers in the Republican Party think about race. And the substance of that thought pretty much sort of, you know, eh, mostly boils down to blaming Black people for their problems, right? Uh, sort of, it doesn't, not invoking racism and shifting conversation away from racial inequality and systematic racism, right? So the sort of seeds of uh, the sort of uh, anti-immigrant and what we're seeing in this election cycle, right, sort of like anti-Black rhetoric, anti-Black Lives Matter rhetoric, um, had not just been planted long before Trump, but were growing and thriving long before Trump. In some ways, you know, we can think about sort of Trump as on steroids for this content. And I think, you know, it also helps us understand that there's a reason that the free market populism didn't get the same traction as its white nationalist cousin, right? The Tea Party sort of was big, but as Larry lays out, um, you know, and as uh, we were just talking about uh, with Cynthia's talk, you know, there was a little bit of a fizzle with it, right? And I guess this is an interesting question as to what extent, you know, we'll see a parallel with Trumpism. But I'd argue that, you know, the white national, the anti-immigrant sort of white grievance cousin of uh, free market populism got more traction because a sizable majority of Americans have policy positions that are inconsistent with small government and laissez-faire approach to markets, right? In contrast, the politics of white grievance has a much broader base. And while those politics have traditionally had a home on the political right in the US, that appetite for white grievance politics cuts across partisan lines and in some ways can help us understand the sort of um, across the aisle draw that Trump laid out in 2016. Indeed, after the spring and summer of protests against racial inequality this year, concerns about white people's response to racial protests animated the discussion around the fall election. Trump certainly leveraged it in his re-election campaign, as Larry just noted, right? But in some way, I would say we shouldn't think about this as a shift from anti-immigrant to sort of like anti-Black Lives Matter or anti-left more broadly. Um, well, we can think about it that way, but we can also think about it as a consistency of white grievance, right? As sort of um, providing a baseline, this sort of baseline content of Trump's politics and of his populism. And even though Trump didn't win, the tendency to lean into white grievance is currently threatening the stability of the Democratic coalition that just elected Joe Biden as the next president, right? So with all this talk around, you know, uh, is defund the police, right, gonna have negative effects on Democratic electoral chances down the line, 
you know, we can think of that as in some ways in my book on Black Republicans, one of the things I talk about is that Black people within the Republican Party have to talk about race in a way that sits comfortably with what white gatekeepers in the GOP think. We can certainly start to think about these conversations around, you know, should we be saying defund the police? Or, you know, how do we think about incorporating the Black Lives Matter movement into democratic politics as a parallel? Uh, dynamic of what happens um, on the left and with a similar sort of approach to, you know, policing the way that Black people talk about Blackness. Now, what Larry has done with this book is show how Trump's election didn't introduce new content into the political scene, right? Certainly the anti-immigrant sentiment and racism and American first attitudes weren't alien to non-white people in the US, right? Like I think, you know, this idea that um, Trump was doing something new and different um, for, you know, we can think about mostly in terms of like the form, the social form in which he delivered this content, but the notion that anti-immigrant sentiments, sentiment and racism um, in America first attitudes were new, didn't support, the notion that it's new would sort of take most non-white people in America uh, by surprise. No, what Trump did was present standard content in a new form, one that was socially acceptable and framed in a way that allowed for a deflection of charges of racism, right? Indeed, one interesting success of his populist framing has been the potential appeal of this America first white grievance content to non-white people. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A if people are interested. I mean, I have some thoughts on it. I'm sort of moved on to studying different stuff, but um, it's hard not to pay attention to. So um, I'll wrap up there in the spirit of like saving time and getting to questions, but I wanna close by saying that with the book, Larry weaves a subtle story about the broad carrying capacity of populism, the constraints of the US two-party system, the power of partisanship as an identity, and the salience of white grievance among large swaths of the US electorate. So with that, Larry, thanks for writing a great book and for providing me with some content in this online semester uh, to motivate a class of weary social theory students. Wonderful. Well, thank, thank you for, for, for connecting me to Simba. This is, <laughs> this is quite flattering. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fields. Uh, theoretically rich, analytically deep, but also with the immediate practical benefits. Uh, that should be on the back cover, maybe, of, of Larry's book. Thank you very much. Again, you've introduced a number of, of stimulating issues around the specifics of the United States context and the links to commonalities and also differences on the global stage, particularly in Europe. Uh, I think it was particularly stimulating to remind us of uh, Black Republicans, which is the central topic of your book, which is a very unusual, uh, regarded as an unusual category. Uh, and we have to think often and ambivalently about their plight. And your presentation reminded me of a scene in the movie many, many years ago by Spike Lee, Get on the Bus. I don't know if you remember what happened to the Black conservative at that time. I'm certainly not advocating that, but that's what came to mind. Okay. We have more than enough uh, issues and items and uh, thoughts and facts and contentions to discuss. I'd like to thank the presenters for your very stimulating and thought-provoking presentations. I'd like to remind people in the audience that you can use the Q&A feature to ask questions. I'm about to ask the first question later on. We'll ask the panelists if they wanna ask a question of one another, depending on how the time goes. We have six or seven questions. I realized that when people ask questions at the start, I didn't inform them that we were going to mention their names. And because we didn't do that, I'm not gonna mention the names of people who are asking the questions. If you've asked a question and you'd like me to mention your name, just send it in again through the, the Q&A and I'll be more than happy to mention your name. Okay, first question. I'd love to hear the panel's comments, observations, lamentations about the recent news from Germany regarding small neo-Nazi flare-ups. Is it all due to refugees or to something else? Who'd like to take that? Um, I'd, like to, I'd like 
I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'd like to make one observation on that. I mean, I'm going to defer to Cynthia on, on such matters, but um, one thing which, is, which struck me in the last week was um, that a parallel to anti-lockdown uh, demonstrations in the US have now become uh, uh, a prominent in Germany. And there is even rhetoric in Germany which parallels the extreme rhetoric on this in the US, um, which says that this is Nazi-like in its, in its uh, restriction of liberty. So to see that at, on, the, on the level of, um, you know, in the context of, of Germany, I find extraordinary. Um, I also wonder to what extent, I mean, I have always been struck by the kind of transatlantic exchange in, in illiberal circles and, you know, so for example, uh, whiteness traveling to Europe as a, as a category um, or replacement theory running from, from France uh, into the USA. I wonder uh, uh, to what extent this extreme rhetoric about tyranny and, and even bringing up Nazism is, is uh, a, 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 in some way an import from the USA. Anyone else like to comment? There's a lot that I can say about the German case. Obviously, I, most people know that I spent 20 years um, doing empirical research on the far right in Germany and wrote a couple of books about the German case. So um, I'll try not to take up too much time, but happy to, to go into this as much as people are interested. Uh, I, I have a few things to say about it. One is that uh, Larry's absolutely right. We've had 90 cases of uh, anti-shelter-in-place, anti-corona restriction protests organized just between April and September by the far right in Germany, uh, a third of which really were centered in one state in the east, Sachsen-Anhalt. And uh, so there's a, there's a real surge of similar kinds of tactics and strategies of um, the far right making arguments that uh, the government's um, incapable, um, you know, illegitimate that a stronger authoritarian state would do a better job of it, um, trying to sow distrust and dissent in the population, uh, and um, and also just celebrate chaos and create more chaos in the kind of the accelerationist fringe of the far right. Um, and I would probably characterize it. I know the question came in as about being a few flare-ups, but I would question it, characterize it as a more systematic and systemic problem than that. Not just in Germany, but globally. Uh, we have had a 320% increase in far-right terror over the last five years globally. Um, these increases are going up everywhere, including in the U.S., starting before this administration on every measure that we have available, plots foiled by the FBI, actual lethality, propaganda being circulated, numbers of hate crimes. Uh, on every measure we have available, we know that white supremacist extremism, far-right extremism has been increasing, and this year we'll probably see even worse numbers. Um, in Germany, those same statistics are true. We have seen a systematic increase. And I would say the thing that makes Germany different than other countries is that they count and monitor this better than anybody else. So we know that there are 1,400 active investigations into white supremacist extremism in the military and the law enforcement and security services going on in Germany right now. There is absolutely no reason to think that that number would be any different in any other uh, country proportionally. We know that there are recent reports showing similar kinds of problems in the U.S. law enforcement and military and veterans communities, but those are not monitored and tracked in the U.S., nor are they reported or mandated to be reported by um, the Defense Department, for example. So despite repeated attempts um, to get that legislation passed. So, you know, I think that we have um, in Germany a uh, growing um, and more systematic problem, as I said, that's not tied to Germany, but as part of this kind of global flare up. But yes, you're seeing um, some really troubling signs, just like the really um, disgusting uh, plans and plots that were in place in Michigan now coming out in terms of the, the depth and sophistication of those plots and the plans for a week long series of executions televised, for example, 
uh, that have just been released, the, the depth of those plans around the Michigan governor's um, capture, the same kinds of very violent far-right extremist and terrorist plots are happening in Germany um, with multiple arrests. And I think those are the neo-Nazi flare-ups that you've mentioned. So I think, yes, there have been flare-ups, but they're on the backs of what has been a much bigger rising tide, um, not just in Germany, but globally. And Germany is monitoring and tracking it because of their history and because of what they're allowed to do in terms of tracking and monitoring uh, things that would not be allowed here due to free speech protections, essentially. Um, so they can say there are 24,700 24, uh, right-wing extremists in the country, half of whom are deemed ready to be violent. The U.S. would never be able to come up with a figure like that. Um, you know, we just don't have that. And maybe we shouldn't have that kind of, right? That's a constitutional question. But we know what's going on in Germany, and there's absolutely no reason to think it's different there than anywhere else. They just have, in my opinion, also better interventions, which is what I've been studying for the last 20 years um, to try to thwart it. Uh, but yes, I think it's part of a global rise that um, we see in the US, we see in Germany, and we're seeing uh, across Europe, North America, Australia, New Zealand, um, and, uh, and even in places like India um, and uh, Brazil. So I, I'm happy to go back to that. I know it's a very depressing um, Kind of analysis of it, but uh, but but it is, I think, um, a bigger issue than than has been paid attention to very much. Um, yes, uh, in terms of that context. Well, sometimes we have to face the harsh facts. I just want to let you know it's not my role as moderator to silence you, but I just want to let you know that there are twelve questions pending, and I don't want you to feel like each of you has to answer each question. I'll go with your flow. You should take as long as you want, yeah, but I do want you to know that. Some people have asked several questions. I'm only gonna raise one question from each of them and try to come back later. That's what I've been advised to do. Next question, what is the overlap between QAnon and the evangelicals? Anyone? To some extent, to some extent, um, you know, the, the, they allied one into the other um, and they allied in this way that um, the place or the position given to Donald Trump, it's, it's this conundrum on the American left and, and maybe elsewhere. How is it that the uh, evangelicals, the people who used to call themselves the moral majority could so thoroughly get behind and become the strongest uh, political and, and electoral base of Trumpism um, when Trump is so plainly, uh, uh, let us say, amoral and in many ways uh, morally repulsive. Um, and the way they did it, or, or what, what, what was largely arrived at, was reading Donald Trump back into the Bible. And okay, he's this fallen character, but God produced King David, who was a crummy character, a fallen character as well. And he led the Hebrews and, and King Cyrus, who uh, saved the Hebrews from the uh, Babylonian captivity. And, and, and it goes on. I think that this almost um, deification of, of Trump has, has uh, a kind of, it has elided into Trump Trump's role in the QAnon fantasy, which is um, he's, as he once said about himself, he's the only one who can fix it. And what he is, he has been delivered to the US to do is to deliver the US from um, the, the um, uh, devil worshiping, pedophilia, um, r satanic ritual Democrats, uh, and only he can do it. And, um, and so this, this place of Trump as a kind of providential deliverance uh, connects the, the uh, evangelical support from him for the uh, QAnon support. And I would just uh, add to that, 
that we now face the question of QAnon has has argued that um, Trump is in the position of the presidency in order to expose the the uh, the demonic conspiracy. Um, what will happen to that belief when Trump is no longer in the presidency? I think is 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 a, is a really significant question. Uh, you know, there 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 was an old um, sociological study when when prophecy fails, which which dealt with people who expected who were part of a group that expected the world to end. And how did they deal with the cognitive dissonance of the world not ending? I think um, Trump no longer being in the presidency will present a question of cognitive dissonance in a parallel fashion. And the resolution of that cognitive dissonance may be very bumpy. I think, uh, I'll, I mean, I have just one quick addition to that, which is, that all makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think, you know, it's interesting. I mean, it's an empirical question that I'm not quite sure we have great data on, on the actual overlap between, you know, sort of uh, people who believe in QAnon and people who identify as the evangelicals. Although I do think um, certainly the extent to which the QAnon stuff is gaining legitimization, right? It's probably, uh, sort of spreading, right? And so in terms of like the people who identify as evangelical are, I mean, guys, to use a sort of area, greater hazard for falling into um, a QAnon membership. But I think another parallel that's worth thinking about is less about sort of a bottom up, like how many people believe both, but is to think about the parallels in which Republican leadership and party sort of grandees treat them both as legitimate constituencies, right? Like who are meant to be sort of ta tailored to and have a place at the table. And in some ways that's perhaps, um, I don't know, more disturbing or like troubling the extent to which, you know, both of these groups now operate as, you know, um, uh, members of members under the tent, right? And uh, both can command sort of resources and attention from GOP leadership. So which serves as, you know, a uh, legitimizing thing for QAnon. Um, and it's interesting, I mean, I'm, I'd be curious to what, how evangelical leaders would think about that or talk about that if it was presented to them in that way that like, look, Guys, they're treating the QAnon folks the same way they treat you. It's just like, you know, parties interested in the success of the GOP, so we have to cater to them. How does it make you feel? But yeah, so anyway, so I think, you know, thinking about it from both ends, from the bottom up in terms of like how people uh, identify and what they believe, but also the flip side in terms of how do, uh, uh, you know, sort of a party gatekeepers, party leadership interact with the two uh, groups is important. Okay, uh, thank you. Next question. Uh, I assume this question is for you, Larry, but it could be open to everyone. A few months ago, somebody asked you if populism has morphed into fascism. You said no at that time. They hadn't crossed the Rubicon. Since then, have we moved closer to the Rubicon or even crossed it? There are... Um two major and one minor Rubicons that I can think of. Um, one is the, um, the presence of, uh, of, of militias connected to the political party. And that has reached a level which, which we haven't seen in the USA before. Um, it's the, the, maybe the, um, uh, most notable aspect of that was was Trump calling out the Proud Boys in 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 the uh, uh, presidential debate with with Biden, and even more than that, the extent to which the Proud Boys responded to that, as though he were their commander and they were following orders. 
So, uh, and that is connected up with um, the use of, of forces within, essentially within the Department of Homeland Security who, who have been used uh, on the streets of Washington and Portland and, and so forth. Um, in, in sometimes without insignia, sometimes pulling people off the streets into vans in a way that makes them, and Trump has been explicit about this, continuous or partners of the private militias. So to, to, to the extent to which um, militias is a Rubicon, um, the toes are in the water. Uh, the second Rubicon is uh, uh, what in Germany was called the Enabling Act, which, um, and in Italy, they, in, under fascism, there was a parallel, which was to declare an emergency and then rule by decree. Um, this, of course, has come to pass in uh, Hungary, which is perhaps the leading illiberal country uh, in, in Europe at the moment. Um, and it obviously has not come to pass in the USA, uh, but there is its germ and its germ is what has happened on the uh, Southern border. On the Southern border, uh, the treatment of immigrants and people seeking, um, uh, you know, to, to, to come to the USA to avoid um, you know, dreadful situations in their home, in their homelands, um, seeking asylum. Uh, you know, there emergency has been declared and what happens under such circumstances is rights, either constitutional or simply human rights um, dissolve. They are no longer operative. And so there in some way has been a cadre produced in, on the Southern border of, um, of what the ensemble of declaring an emergency would be. Um, that hasn't happened in the USA, um, uh, you know, on a national scale in any way, um, although, we now are in uh, this interregnum where that still presents itself as a worry. The third Rubicon is the leadership principle, uh, the Führer, Führer Prinzip, um, where uh, the, the, the leader is so deified that he comes to define what the nation's interests are and what the what the nation nation stands for, and to an extraordinary extent, I think that is the Rubicon most crossed. That that um, uh, Trump followers and I tried to suggest this in my earlier remarks. Trump followers have embraced the leader in a way that. Um, uh, resembles the kind of leadership, leader to follower relationship, which characterized both Nazism and fascism in the 20th century. Thank you. Maybe I could ask the next question, which is related and we could put it, the question is put to the panel. Where would the panelists draw the line between right and far right? What do we consider, what we, um, what do we consider normative right versus alt-right? In the view of this questioner, it's hard to frame the right. Oh, my question has disappeared. Uh, oh, the question's gone. I don't know who's doing that, but it's gone. Okay, so where would you frame the distinction between the right and the far right, the alt-right? Well, I can start with that one if, if you want. Um, so I define the, first of all, I, in my most recent book, I, I do use the term far right, but I say right in the first chapter that I think it's the best bad term we have for the phenomenon. I don't even like the term. We just don't really have a better term to encompass and 
the, the spectrum of what's going on with and how you understand sort of anti-government extremism, single issue anti-abortion activists um, and extremists uh, and things like conspirational seditionists, QAnon folks and the white supremacist extremists, why would you lump them all into one big group? They are also different. Um, and I put them into a group called the far right because they share certain characteristics that are both kind of anti-democracy, anti-democratic values, whether that comes out through authoritarianism or a um, failure to protect minority rights or reduction of freedoms of the press or something else. Um, they are also dehumanizing in many cases, and they set up hierarchies of inferiority or superiority across uh, Christian supremacy, male supremacy movements, including the incel movements, uh, and white supremacist and white supremacy movements. Um, and then they, uh, and so not all of them do the same thing, but then third is a category of conspiracy and fantasy. They rely on a kind of um, fantasy about restoration, about a golden era, about some way back to a utopian, it's a future utopia that can be achieved that will also be a nostalgia, kind of rooted in nostalgia for the past, often uses myths and legends and fantasies. So whether that's make America great again or some kind of fantasy and dystopian fantasy and fears about um, a conspiracy around a great replacement uh, as white supremacists do, right? So all kinds of conspiracies, but also blended with a kind of nostalgia and utopian ideals. Uh, and then fourth is a, not just a willingness to use violence, but often a valorization and a call to violence in the name of a cause um, and a framing of that violence as heroic. And so on the accelerationist fringe, we have um, most recent terrorists have uh, Christchurch and El Paso, for example, um, called on the use of mass violence like that to inspire others as a, as a means to create more chaos, eventually bring down um, civilization as a goal in itself, and then restore a new reborn Phoenix-like rise of the ashes white civilization. So, you know, there's lots of different dimensions to that, but those four components are how I define far right and what distinguishes kind of what I would call ordinary um, right-wing politics from the extreme fringe and what I call far right. And so uh, in some combination, anything on the far right fringe that I analyze has that has that one of those four components, if not, and usually more than one. Can, let, me, let me address um, that for a second. Uh, one of the ways I think of, of dividing up the right is uh, between conservatism, which could be classical conservatism or establishment conservatism and the insurrectionary right and um, classical conservatism and, and establishment conservatism uh, throughout the 20th century and, and, and into our day have a, uh, a dicey relationship often with, with uh, insurrectionist movements on their right. I like the analogy of riding a tiger that, that uh, uh, the establishment conservatism, you know, uh, typically or, or frequently um, sees the insurrectionary right as a means of, of uh, fighting against the, 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 um, or their ordinary opposition, like the Democratic Party. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that you ride the tiger and sometimes the tiger wins and sometimes you, 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 know, you, you fail to ride it, you get eaten by the tiger. Um, that certainly happened in, with the conservative establishments in, in uh, Germany and Italy in the 20th century. Um, and it does appear uh, that in the USA, uh, the conservative establishment is playing a similar game. Okay, thank you very much. I do want to remind you, we still have 12 or 15 questions left. We're not going to get to them. We have almost 100 people still present. I'll try my best to get to them. Let's see what we can do. So uh, how critical is Donald Trump to the sustained future of the alt-right wing? The Tea Party movement was independent of focus on a particular individual leader, I presume, prior to Trump. Should we expect that a strong man will now be at the center of right-wing movements in the United States going forward? And I guess, will it be Trump? Uh, 
there are a lot of contenders to be uh, the the Trump post Trump, um, and so um, you know that there is there's a there's this very strange thing about Trump and Trumpism is that normally when a an ideology or a way of thinking comes to comes to power, um, you know it has been sort of thought out and then politicians come to represent it and 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 they can uh, uh, you know, get into or win high political office. Trump um, kind of reversed that. He, 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 he um, came, you know, won the presidency and since then there has been this this industry of backfilling behind him and trying to come up with um, a uh, an ideology that that explains Trumpism, and um, and that's ongoing. And there are um, uh, you know institutions that are now uh, like in California, the Claremont Institute and others. <clears throat> the point being that um, the movement, what Trump represents will not disappear if Trump himself goes away. Um, there are There is an evolving ideology, which often goes by the name national conservatism. And, um, and there are any number of individuals who one could name um, uh, who are preparing themselves to be the successor. Come on, Larry, give us a couple of names. Sure. Um, well, there's, there's, there's the children, Donald Jr. Oh. And, and so oh. forth. But more serious than that, there is the senator from uh, Missouri called Josh Hawley, who distinguished himself uh, at one of the conventions of national conservatism. Um, another person who distinguished himself there and has um, made um, his, his presence known uh, perhaps more than anyone else is Tucker Carlson, who, who people talk about as running for president. Um, and he does nothing to tamp down that. And, and then there are other figures in the Senate um, people like uh, uh, Ted Cruz, who has managed to move ideologically uh, from, from having been kind of the, the, uh, the alternative to Trump, finally, at the end of the 2016 uh, Republican primaries. Okay, um, don't and, scare us anymore. Don't scare us anymore. Then, then I'll leave Tom Cotton out of it. Okay, thanks very much. I'm sorry to cut you, but I want to get to the, a couple no, more no. questions. Okay. I'm going to take the liberty of asking two questions rather than one because they cover some different terrain. First question, can we hear some more from the panel about partisan identity in the US just at a time when it is fading away in much of the world? Second question, Cynthia, do you draw parallels between white second wave feminism and the reformed feminism in scare quotes that the Tea Party used to mobilize white conservative women? Interesting. I can answer the, the second question, at least briefly, um, which is that I, I haven't drawn explicit parallels, but now that you say it, uh, it's I, that parallel seems pretty obvious. Um, the place where I've articulated this most recently is in a report for the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung on gender and far right politics in the US, which was just um, posted right before the election. So it's on their website and free to download. And I have, it's a long report um, looking at the mobilization of women, conservative white women in the Tea Party and then into Trump supporters and what some of those, and there was another question here that I can also just sort of address at the same time, which is about the reproductive rights. And I, I talk about that there as well, attacks how central the issue of abortion is here. Um, and the idea that Trump was going to save, you know, the moral decline of the nation um, by appointing um, anti-abortion judges and, uh, you know, and, and how much of the success 
as it's seen um, by uh, by folks who are pro-life of him doing just that um, uh, played a role here in the last few weeks, I think. So, um, so uh, I haven't, but it's interesting in terms of that second wave feminism being defined around equality and equal rights. And that's what they are hearkening back to instead of choice. And they're trying to frame feminism with while still being anti-abortion. Um, and so in many ways, I do think that they are kind of hearkening back to that 1980s definition of equal pay, equal rights, um, and trying to show uh, autonomy from government dependence as, as being the, the mobilizing force. Okay, anyone want to respond to partisan question? Or so, oh, I was gonna add, I, mean, I can say a little bit about it. I, mean, I think it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, in some ways, I think, um, certainly in the current discourse, a lot of this gets attributed to thinking about sort of Trump and like Trump sort of like confusing partisanship with support for Trump. But I think, uh, it, you know, it, the, the increasing partisanship of within the US was sort of happening before Trump, right? Like if you look at sort of um, voting patterns in Congress, right? Like we see an increasing sort of partisanship that happens right, where sort of um, uh, elected officials sort of voting along party lines increasingly, but also among the population in general, um, we see sort of increasing residential segregation where like you only live with around people who have the same kind of political attitudes and partisan identities as you, um, but also this increasing sense of like, you know, your partisanship becomes uh, uh, sort of central in terms of the idea how you think about yourself right so uh, in terms of you know the meaning and importance of partisanship increasing over time uh, which was happening before Trump uh, so actually I think you know the extent to which you know it's sort of um, gonna linger uh, I mean it's interesting Trump could potentially have a counter effect on that. I mean, certainly this is, you know, the language that Biden wants to invoke now of like, you know, reaching across the aisle, we're gonna all work together um, and sort of play on this idea that people are sort of post uh, or gonna be over partisanship after Trump. Yet, you know, I think on the Republican side, there's a, a recognition of how effective Trump was able to leverage partisanship and sort of like a, anti or uh, anti-partisanship or sort of like negative partisanship um and bring it to the fore so it's the kind of thing that isn't gonna work in an asymmetrical way right so like uh the democrats sort of being like let's be beyond partisanship and work across the aisle isn't going to be very effective if the republicans are like oh right this partisan energy has worked. Let's keep going with it, keep going with it. And I think this ties back into Larry's answer to the previous question of like, you know, what happens post Trump? I mean, I think partly, you know, this is about the ways in which uh, Trumpism and the sort of, you know, certainly the uh, performative politics of Trump, um, which includes negative partisanship, have been incorporated into the sort of mainstream of, you know, party operations uh, among Republicans. So, yeah, I mean, I guess in some ways I'm not particularly uh, optimistic about it. Um, I mean, it's certainly, you know, there's a way to think about what happens if the Democrats become better at it and it becomes sort of a more competitive, there's sort of a mutually assured destruction approach to this. Um, but yeah, so I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you. We may have time for two more questions, at least. If there is a question about whether you see Donald Trump as a fascist. I think your response, Larry, has addressed those main issues in terms of the three types of Rubicon. So I'm going to take the liberty of jumping over that. Uh, next question. A person would like to know what the panelists think about the, the decision by Trump and by leaders in the UK and France to push against critical race theory, to teach American exceptionalism, and how this response relates to anti-left resentment. I mean, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I think it's sort of, um, again, it's like this effort uh, to link sort of uh, white grievance to a sort of broader uh, anti-leftism. And I mean, I think in some ways, you know, it's, you know, uh, 
in some ways a pretty transparent play, right? Um, and so, I mean, it's, what's been interesting about the whole dynamic is the way it's been juxtaposed. It's not just about banning critical race theory. It's also about replacing it. Right with sort of uh, uh, this, these sort of American exceptionalism, sort of like uh, a positive story about American history, and in some way, because right, and in some ways that does. It's interesting to think about what that shift, shift means, because like the notion of sort of a, a rejection of uh, uh, conversation around systematic racism, or uh, thinking about you know. Um, uh, Black oppression in the United States, right? Like resistance to those ideas aren't new, right? But what does seem sort of fairly novel is the replacement, right? Sort of like remove but replace. And it's this replacing idea um, of saying, you know, the 1619 project is wrong, but we're going to come up with something else that sort of says America is great. Um, is perhaps like the sort of powerful uh, uh, intervention in terms of like uh, the same content in a new form. <laughs> Yeah, I would just add to that. I absolutely agree with Corey's assessment. Um, but, and I think, and just to crib from my own new book, uh, I have a chapter on higher ed that predates obviously that, that executive order, but, um, but arguing that higher ed is a consistent, constant target um, for the far right, really for these twin reasons. One is that they, um, you know, they want to attack higher ed and bring it down for being a site of a cultural Marxist plot, you know, to follow follow the failed revolution of the, the laborers with a revolution of the mind and sort of inculcate and indoctrinate young people and get um, that brainwashing across. So this sort of like attack on li the supposed liberal bias, um, but even on, uh, you know, on, on variety of practices from pronoun usage to transgender bathrooms, all kinds of gendered ideas about what happens on campuses have been attacked as well. So there's constant attacks on scholars, um, campuses get targeted for propaganda more heavily than any place else in the country for white supremacist propaganda as the ADL has documented really nicely. So all of those phenomena about attacking college and attacking higher education and knowledge, this is very consistent with that. But the second part of that is that they've also um, discovered that they can use knowledge and they need their own knowledge to create the intellectual leadership of the future. And so they've created, you know, printing presses that promote um, far right ideas. There's summer institutes in Europe run by far right parties, right? And there's, um, and this is part of this replacement of knowledge. You can't just attack knowledge. You have to, you have to create something else. A resurgence of race science has been documented by uh, the journalist Angela Saini and others, right? These attempts to kind of change the trajectory of knowledge production in favor of um, uh, and, and manipulate kind of even social science data or attack data that is that is um, showing demographic change, linking that to criminality, those kinds of things that are happening as well within the far right. So not just the attacks, but also the creation and manipulation of knowledge structures to produce knowledge that will promote far right extreme ideas, uh, anti-immigration ideas um, is, is a really important part of that strategy as well. That bell going off was to remind me that we're at the limit. We have time nominally for one last question. Rather than going to the questions, I'd like to see if any of the panelists have a question they'd like to ask somebody else on the panel. But it will have to be quick, and the response will have to be quick. Anyone got a desperate question or a question they desperately want to ask? Well, I would just ask Larry, given given that everybody knows how long it takes a book to finish and come to production. I know I was supposed to be at a meeting with you that you didn't come to because you were writing this like, what, two years ago or something, finishing the book. So what's next? What are you writing now? And um, and what would be, you know, what's what's going to be next on, on your plate that we can read in a couple of years? The story continues. Um, that is to say that that I am following closely one where does Trumpism go? And two, um, what novelty may be uh, uh, sort of being confected that, that um, will change the direction of things? And, uh, and the, the, you know, I have some ideas about that at the moment, um, but they're very rough. And um, I, I need, I, you know, um, I will look at 
the continuing developments on the right um, because they're going to face significant questions. There, there are gonna be forks in the road post-Trump and which forks they take will be very significant for not only politics in the USA, but the general illiberal zeitgeist um, that, that has you know, taken over, as you say, in, in, in Europe and, and Turkey and, and, and India and so forth. So I, I, um, I think there will be new directions and I have some notions of what they are. But that's kind of um, the direction in which I'm thinking of okay. what happens. Thank you. And of course, we assume that you're continuing to promote discussion of this current book and its implications. And we thank you. Thank you. Let me take the opportunity to thank everybody, all the panelists, for joining us today for this Zoom uh, conference, Zoom seminar. I found it fascinating, stimulating, thought-provoking, a little anxiety causing, but I knew that before. Uh, we have some names and so on. I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us today. There are a, a large number of people who joined us who I'm sure thought that this was also very stimulating. We know that everyone's time is important. We know many people are Zoomed out. So we thank you again on behalf of the Institute, on behalf of the Center for Right-Wing Studies, and on behalf of producer and co-producer Deborah Lustig and Max Maxwell Vander, Maxwell, oh, I've forgotten his second name. Oh, that's going to get him upset. Vanderwalker. 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 Yeah, I should know. Sincere apologies. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Good luck with your continuing work. We wish you every success. Keep safe. Keep well. And we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you.